Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tevedi from Department of Biosciences of Ayanini, IIT Guwahati and what we are discussing, we are discussing about the uh, biotechnology and as well as we are discussing about the recombinant DNA technology in this particular uh, series of lectures what we are discussing about the IIT pro programs. So, in the previous lecture if you remember that we have discussed about the on overview of the recombinant DNA technology and then we have said that if you want to understand the recombinant DNA technology, you have to understand the multiple processes, you have to understand about the multiple enzymes and so on. So, what you have seen is that uh, we have discussed about the biotechnology, its discoveries and all these kind of scientific achievements which leads to the development of uh, robust techniques which can be utilized for many types of applications. In today's lecture, we are going to discuss more about the biotechnology and we are going to discuss some more aspects, some more exciting aspects of the, uh, the techniques so that you, it will be easier for you to understand the uh, whole process and you can be able to utilize this process into the, your own uh, requirements. So, as we discussed in the last uh, lecture, we discussed that the, if you want to perform the uh, recombinant DNA technology, you require a genome which you are going to isolate from the, your target organisms. Then you are going to isolate the gene with the help of the polymerase chain reactions. Once you have a gene, you are actually going to perform the restriction digestions and then you are going to get a, a, a fragment which has the cohesive ends. The similar kind of procedure you are also going to perform for the plasmids and you are going to cut the plasmid with the same set of restriction enzymes and as a result of this you are going to have a fragment which is a cohesive ends, you are going to have the plasmids with the uh, cohesive ends of the same uh, restriction enzyme. Then you are going to put them together and you are going to get the recombinant DNA. Then this recombinant DNA has to be transformed into the bacterial cell or you are going to deliver the DNA into the host cells and at the end you are going to select and screen the, uh, uh, the transformed uh, uh, colonies and at the end you are going to utilize these transformed colonies for the other many types of downstream applications. So, now what you see here in this particular scheme uh, you are actually going to utilize the two major component. One, you are going to utilize the, uh, the cells where you are actually going to uh, perform the uh, uh, transformations right. So, you are going to use this right. This is one of the major uh, uh, component of the recombinant DNA technology right where you are actually going to insert the DNA of your interest right the recombinant DNA what you have produced right. This recombinant DNA you are going to insert into this particular thing right. And this is going to be called as host right and similarly you also require a material which actually can carry the your gene of your interest in the form of the recombinant uh, plasmids or recombinant DNA and this is going to be called as the transforming agents. So, if we uh, see very carefully, we what you require, you require the two components. You require a host and you also require a DNA carrying uh, units, right, or DNA carrying unit. This, this, this can vary and as well as this can vary. And uh, if you see in this particular chapter, what we are going to discuss, we are going to discuss how the host as well as the DNA carrying unit could be compatible with each other and how they are very very they are very very important for successfully performing the recombinant DNA technology. So, what we said that you require the two different components one is host cells right and another one is the transforming agents such as the plasmid. So, we have taken an example of plasmid, but we are actually going to have the diversified array of the transforming agents. Now, in within the host cells, you are going to have the multiple options, you are going to have the prokaryotic cells 
or you can actually going to have the eukaryotic cell within the eukaryotic cell also you are going to have the option of the unicellular eukaryotic cell such as yeast <coughs> or multicellular uh, animal cells right or the multicellular plant cells right uh, i am not taking uh, the into account the fungus or other kinds of host cells because they are very very specific right and what you see here is that every host cell is having its cognate transforming agent and that is why it is called as two component system where you require a host cell and then you also require a transforming agent. For example, if we take the prokaryotes, the transforming agent is going to be a plasmid, right? Whereas, if you take the yeast or if you take the animals, if you take the plants, then transforming agents are going to be different. For example, in the yeast, you are going to have the yeast uh, plasmids, right? And these uh, or in the case of animals, you require the mammalian uh, vectors. Then you require the plant, you are also going to require the plant vectors. And all these are different. In, they are different in terms of the different types of properties. Uh, prokaryotic uh, plasmids are very, very different from the yeast or animal or plants. And that is why you require the two component. One is the host cell, the other is the transforming agents. So, what we are going to discuss? First, we are going to discuss about the host cells because the selection of the host cells and the uh, properties of the host cell actually going to decide what transforming agent you are going to use. So, first we are going to discuss about the host cells and the second we are going to discuss about the transforming agents. So, let us discuss about the host cells and within the host cells we have the um, many uh, choices so that you can actually be able to select the right choice according to your requirements. Now, question comes what is the host? As I already explained, the host is the cell where you are actually, which you, whose machinery you are going to use for the uh, propagation of the recombinant DNA and as well as the downstream production of proteins or downstream production of the different types of um, um, products. So, in biotechnology, a host organism serves as a platform for producing the particular compound such as the protein or the metabolite or is utilized to replicate and express the foreign genetic information. In biotechnology, the common host organisms include yeast, mammalian cells, plants and the bacteria such as Bacillus subtilis and as well as the E. coli. So, what you see here is that we have the host cells right and within the host cells you are going to have the prokaryotic cell, you are going to have the yeast cells you are going to have the animal cells and you are going to have the plant cells right. Uh, within the prokaryotic cell you are going to have the E. coli or you are going to have the bacillus subtilis. These are the two host what is present in your course uh, in prokaryotes you can even have the other kinds of sources or other kinds of host also, but that we are not discussing because of the limitation of this particular chapter. Uh, what is the requirement of a host? So, a host should allow the easy entry of the recombinant DNA into the cell and should not consider the recombinant DNA as a foreign DNA and degrade it. This is very, very important, right? So, host cell should recognize the transforming agents, like right? the DNA what you are going to produce and it is going to, you are going to produce a recombinant DNA, right, in the, in, in the particular transforming agents, whether it is a plasmid or whether it is a uh, like vectors, right, uh, yeast vectors or animal vectors or plant vectors, you are going to have a recombinant DNA. This recombinant DNA could be recognized as self or it could be recognized as non-self, right. Because if you, if when you, when we, when you, when you see, when you go through the content of this particular course, you will realize at the later part that uh, the bacterial cell or the host cells actually ha do have a mechanism through which they can be able to recognize a recombinant DNA as self or the non-self. Now that is a something which is very, very important. If the bacterial cell does not recognize the recombinant DNA as self then it is actually going to destroy this bacterial cell with the help of the so many uh, you know DNA degrading enzyme present in that cell. 
so that is not something which is and that is very very important criteria for selecting a host right uh, so the host must not supply or must supply all the required enzyme and protein to ensure the smooth replication of the vector dna along with the insert that is the second aspect second aspect is that you are going to insert one copy of that recombinant dna right that recombinant dna is actually going to have the origin of replications right and utilizing this and this originating replication is actually going to utilize the replication factors right for the uh, replications right you, you know that we have you require the gyrase you require the topo isomerases you require the dna polymerases you require the single standard dna binding proteins and so on so all these replication factors should be supplied by the host so that when you insert one copy of this particular dna it should actually give you 5 to 500 copies of this particular uh, DNA so that they are actually going to propagate and that is how they are actually going to give you the large quantity of protein or they can be utilized for other kinds of downstream applications such as if you want to utilize this particular host only for the cloning purpose and so on right. So, uh, as I said you know host cells could be of different types it could be a prokaryotic host cells or it could be a eukaryotic host cells. Uh, within the prokaryotic cells, we are going to discuss about the E. coli and the bacillus subtilis. So, let us discuss about the E. coli and remember when you discuss about the host cells, these two conditions that host cells should not degrade the recombinant DNA and host cells should supply the required machinery for propagation of the recombinant DNA has to be met, then only you can be able to utilize a particular host cells. So, let us discuss first about the E. coli cell and then we are also going to discuss about the bacillus subtilis as a host cell. So, when you talk about the E. coli or when you want to utilize any host cells, so the first thing what you have to do is you have to study the structure of that particular host cells, you also have to study the biochemistry of that particular host cells and then ultimately you are also going to utilize or you are also going to use uh, or study the uh, replication machinery whether the factors are present and all that. So, E. coli, E. coli is a gram negative rod shaped bacteria of the interior bacteria family. It can be characterized by the following distinctive features right. Uh, cell structures, so you can see this is the cell structure of an E. coli. So, it is a prokaryotic organism devoid of the membrane bound organelle or the nucleus. It cell wall is mainly made up of, of peptidoglycan a characteristic of the gram negative bacteria. The phospholipid and the membrane bound protein in E. coli is a cell membrane uh, control the flow of different particles in and out of the cell. So, cell structure is very much discussed uh, just like a standard bacterial cell right. It is a prokaryotic organism. So, it does not contain the uh, nucleus or the membrane bound organelles. And then it is made up of it is containing a uh, you know thick cell wall. So, this is the cell wall what is present right and uh, this cell wall is uh, selective. So, you are actually going to or within the cell wall you are going to have the plasma membrane and that plasma membrane is going to be selective. So, that it should allow the entry and exit of the uh, particles. Uh, what you see here is the it is also going to have the flagella and other kinds of uh, material. So, that the bacteria can swim from one uh, uh, so, so that bacteria can swim and can reach to the uh, to the uh, food particles and other things. Now, re uh, related to the genome, so the genetic material of the E. coli is a single circular chromosome. This is what you see here right, this is the chromosome of the E. coli with uh, around 4.6 to 5.5 million base pair. E. coli genome is tiny compared to the many other organisms and this is very very useful and advantageous because if the organism's genome is less, it will actually going to utilize uh, ad additional energy what is being present in the cell for replication of the extra chromosomal DNA or the plasmids. Then it also have the metabolism. So, E. coli is a facultative aerobes uh, which means it can metabolize in the presence and absence of the oxygen. It can ferment various carbohydrates and other organic molecule to produce the energy. 
then we will talk about the flagella. So, we already discussed about the flagella. So, some E. coli strains can move using the flagella. The flagella uses its long whip like flagellar flag, uh, appendages that extend from the cell membrane to move across its environment. Then it also contains the pili. So, E. coli has pili cells uh, uh, hair like projection that protrude from the cell surface. Pili are involved in the conjugation in which the bacterial cell transfer the genes horizontally they are used in surface addition also. So, pili is a is a is a very important component it actually uh, uh, participate into the, uh, the you know horizontal gene transfers and it also participate into the conjugations and other kinds of thing and apart from that pili also uh, helps the uh, E. coli to stick to the uh, surface. Then reproductions, so E. coli produce uh, sex asexually by dividing into the two identical daughter cells to the binary fusions. The growth kinetics of the E. coli is exponential, exponential and has three characteristic phases, lag phase, log phase and the stationary phase. So, all these we are not going to discuss right now, but we will discuss when we will discuss about the preparation of the competent cells and other kinds of processes. Then we are talking about the pathogenicity, the E. coli is very uh, E. coli is pathogenic right and some, uh, some strains are benign or the helpful, some cells are pathogenic to the humans. Examples of pathogenic uh, processes include the generation of poisons, attachment to the host tissues and invasion of the host cells. Then E. coli is a very, very important organism for the research purposes because E. coli is very much uh, you know the, we have we know a lot about the E. coli, we know a lot about the its structures, metabolism and so on. So, that is why it is very, very easy for us to manipulate the E. coli and it is easy to study. And one of the most investigated, this is the most investigated organisms in the microbiology and genetics is E. coli because of its straightforward genetic makeup and easily obtainable laboratory manipulation technique. It is valuable model um, organism for the molecular biology, molecular biotechnology and the medical research. Uh, from fundamental research to the creation of the therapies and vaccines against the pathogenic strain and understanding of the biological characteristics of E. coli is essential. So, these are some of the very, very important properties of the E. coli which makes the E. coli a uh, suitable host for making or suitable host for producing the different types of factors or different types of proteins. Now, what is the uh, criteria for using the E. coli as a host? So, E. coli is a gram negative bacteria frequently employed as a host in the molecular biology and biotechnology studies. The various season for its utility as a vector have been given below. right? Uh, it is easy to cultivate, it is well characterized and it is manipulative right and so you can be able to manipulate the E. coli according to your requirements. So, E. coli cultivation and cultural maintenance in the laboratory setting is a very simple and cost efficient. It is multiple multiplied at a very fast rate and can be grown at with a low cost media. So, it is actually been uh, maintained uh, mostly into a LB media. So, it is LB media is a very, very cheap media. In fact, you can actually make even cheaper media like uh, M9 media, right. So, if you make the N9 media, M9 media is very, very cheap compared to the LB media. So, cultivation of the E. coli is very, very cheap. So, you actually can down regulate or you can actually be able to uh, reduce the cost of the uh, your culture or you can actually reduce the cost of the product. Then uh, it is well characterized right. So, it is valuable model organisms one of the most well characterized and well researched microbes right. E. coli is been uh, studied in uh, from the from the very ancient times. So, that it actually can utilized for many types of applications and that is why it is well characterized people know what will be the doubling time people know what other different toxic products E. coli can produce and what are different diseases it can cause majority of the E. coli strains are non pathogenic. So, they can be able to utilize into they can be able to utilize in the lab without the fear of 
uh, getting the infections or without the fear of using the high, uh, high bi safety uh, you know equipment and so on. Then manipulativity, so genetic manipulation of E. coli is comparatively easier. Transformations, transductions and conjugations are well known method involving foreign DNA incorporation into the E. coli cells. So, this will you will see when we are going to discuss about the DNA delivery into the host cells, you will understand that how it easy it is to uh, insert the recombinant DNA into the E. coli cells. For example, you take the recombinant DNA you make the competent cells of the E. coli and then when you incubate them together uh, spontaneously without doing much the, e. coli, the recombinant DNA will enter into the bacterial cell and it will get the transformed cells right. And this recombinant DNA is going to be accepted by the E. coli so that is why it is actually not going to be a trouble for producing the this uh, transformed cells. Then we will talk about the expression system. So, uh, it is it is possible to genetically modify E. coli to highly express the foreign protein or the enzymes. E. coli is induced to produce the desirable protein by the inducible expression vector containing the regulatory element. All these we are going to discuss when we will discuss about the E. coli plasmids right. So, we will discuss about the uh, inducible plasmids and in different types of inducers what you are going to use and that time you will understand this uh, aspect much better. Then uh, talking about the safety, so E. coli cells are uh, generally benign in nature and not harmful, but in certain cases the pathogenic strains have been found which can infect human and animals like. Uh, then economic considerations, uh, because the E. coli has low cultivation cost and high expression yields, it can be economical to use as a host organism. Then E. coli, e. coli versatility and adaptability make it an ideal choice for various applications including the protein productions, metabolic engineering, drug discovery and the bioremediations. However, it is essential to note that while E. coli is a valuable tool in research, Proper safety precautions should always be followed when working with any microorganisms. You know that microorganisms since they are easy to get manipulated, they are easy to get transformed, it is very difficult uh, or it is easy for them to be get transformed themselves and that is how you may actually be not knowing that you are actually working with the pathogenic strain or some pathogenic strain may take over the colony in your own lab and that is how you are actually unknowingly be getting exposed to a pathogenic organism. And that is why when you are working with the microorganisms you are supposed to be very very careful because microorganisms can adopt to the new conditions they can actually be able to make the uh, situation very bad in due course of time ok. Now let us move on to the next uh, host organism and next host organism is Bacillus subtilis. So, Bacillus subtilis, uh, Bacillus subtilis is a wide stripped rod shaped gram positive bacteria in soil and animal digestive tract. It can be identified and characterized by the following features. Cell structures, like E. coli, Bacillus subtilis is also a prokaryotic organism which means that the membrane bound organelle and nucleus are absent. It is classified as the gram positive and has a strong peptidoglycan coating in its cell wall. Phospholipids and protein in the Bacillus subtilis cell membrane control the flow of chemical in and out of the cell. So, this is actually the same as what we have discussed for the E. coli except with the difference that the E. coli is a gram negative bacteria and the Bacillus subtilis is a gram positive bacteria. Then talking about the genome, so it has a single circular genome chromosome that contains the entire genomic DNA of the organism. This is what you see here right, this is the circular chromo chromosome. And with over 4.2 million base pairs, the bacillus genome is uh, mightily small compared to the other organism and compared to the E. coli. So, it is actually having the lower genomic DNA or lower uh, size of the genomic DNA compared to the E. coli. Then talking about the motility, so bacillus subtilis has flagella that allow it to move to the ideal nutrient rich region to colonize and grow free of any hindrance. This phenomena is referred to as at the quorum sensing. So, we will not going to discuss about the quorum sensing, but quorum sensing is a mechanism through which the bacteria is uh, you know spreading the news or spreading or, or actually talking to the other bacteria and uh, that is how they are actually uh, protecting the colony.
because if they uh, experienced a loss of nutrition or if they experienced uh, some kind of changes then that actually you know is spread to the colony and that is how the uh, colony is changing its gene expression profiling and all that. Uh, what you see here is uh, this is this is the plasmids right these are the plasmids the circular extra chromosomal plasmids what you see here and this is the uh, chromosomal DNA. Then we have the metabolism. So, bacillus subtilis is a aerobic bacteria and require oxygen for its metabolism. It may produce energy and grow using the different carbon sources such as sugar, amino acids and organic acids. Then talking about the reproductions, the bacillus subtilis also reproduce asexually by the process of binary fusions. They grow under the ideal condition and produce colonies in the solid media. Then talking about the endospore formation, so bacillus subtilis is well known for its capacity to form the endospores which are incredibly resilient structure that shields the DNA of the bacteria from adverse environmental circumstances owing to its endospores. Bacillus subtilis can withstand the high temperature, desiccations, exposure to the chemicals or radiation and other kinds of conditions. Now, let us talk about the properties of the bacillus subtilis as a host. So, bacillus subtilis is another bacteria used as a host just like E. coli. The common advantage of the bacillus subtilis is the genetic tools. Bacillus subtilis processes many genetic tools and manipulation method, plasmid vectors, transformation techniques and gene knockout system are well identified tools that enable the accurate regulation of gene expression and genome alteration in bacteria. Then security systems, so the robust security system of bacillus subtilis is one of the most advantageous feature of the bacteria. This allows the secretion of recombinant proteins into the extracellular environment which enable the purification of the protein at a faster rate and also the cost effective. Then talking about the safety, most of the commonly used bacterial strain of bacillus subtilis are deemed to be safe and non pathogenic, but safety measures are still taken to avoid any necessarily health hazards. Then talking about the protein folding machinery, this is the space where the bacillus subtilis is being preferred over the E. coli. So, another unique feature of bacillus subtilis it is a, that it is its protein folding machinery, it helps the folding and assembly of heterologous proteins thereby improving their yield and activity. Then relicience, uh, bacillus subtilis is highly relicient and can endure extreme conditions with the help of the endospore formation. This can be helpful in industrial environment where robustness and stability are crucial. So, basically you can use the bacillus subtilis even into the industrial setting and you can also be able to use that for the, uh, the uh, for you know for example, neutralizing some toxic material and something like under the harsh conditions. Uh, then uh, importance of research, so bacillus subtilis is frequently employed as a model organisms in the molecular biology and microbiology studies due to its highly, uh, highly described physiology, relatively simple genetic structures and susceptibility to the genetic manipulation. It is an excellent system for searching the various biological processes such as gene control, sporulations and cell to cell communication and so on. Then talking about the industrial applications. Bacillus subtilis is well known for its capacity to generate a wide range of valuable enzymes and metabolite. It has been employed in synthesizing the antibiotics, enzymes and other biotic agents. Now, if you want to utilize any uh, host whether it is the E. coli or the bacillus subtilis, you are supposed to know how you can be able to extract the recombinant DNA from these cells, so that you can be able to utilize these recombinant DNA for the downstream applications. So, let us discuss about the bacillus, how you can be able to isolate the plasmids from the bacterial sub, uh, bacillus subtilis. We will discuss about the plasmid isolation from the E. coli in a subsequent lectures so when we will talk about the manipulation of the recombinant DNA and so on. So, first discuss about the plasmid isolation from the bacillus subtilis. So, isolation of the plasmid from bacillus subtilis is similar to that of E. coli. It involves the same procedure like the cell culture, cell lysis and purification and uh, what you are supposed to do is first you are going to cell culture. So, bacillus subtilis cells are cultured in a suitable growth media. The medium uh, supports the growth of the bacteria and should be kept at the optimal temperature and pH for their growth. Then you are going to do the cell lysis. The cell lysis cells are harvested from the culture by centrifugation and resuspended in a lysis buffer that contains the enzyme, detergent and salt. 
that break open the cell wall and cell membrane. This allows the release of the cellular content into the plasmid into the buffer. Once the cellular content is being released, what are the content it is going to release? It is actually going to release the DNA, it is going to release the protein, it is going to release the lipid right and within the DNA it is actually going to release the uh, genome of the bacillus subtilis or it is also going to release the plasmid right and our target is plasmid not the genome or the protein or the lipid. So, in the subsequent step what you are going to do is you are going to exclude all of these. So, plasmid extraction so this is what it shows right you inoculate one colony into the bacterial into the culture right then you let them go for regressively then you are going to centrifuge at 4000 rpm for and it is going to give you the bacterial palate then you resuspend that into a lysis buffer and then you mix it right and then ultimately it is going to lyse and release the content and then you are going to uh, you know do the plasmid extractions. So, after cell lysis the mixture contain a complex mixture of cellular component like the genomic DNA, plasmids, proteins and other cellular debris. The plasmids are separated from the other cellular compartment by phenol chloroform extraction or alkaline lysis method or commercially uh, uh, plasmid extraction kits. These methods exploit the differences in the chemical property of the plasmid and the genomic DNA to selectively isolate the plasmid. So, all these we are anyway going to discuss when we will discuss about the plasmid isolation from the E. coli in our subsequent lectures and that time it will be more clear to you that initial steps could be different between the E. coli and the bacterial uh, into the bacillus subtilis and the E. coli, but the subsequent steps are going to be the same and then ultimately you are going to get the plasmids. Then you are going to do the purification, uh, you are going to do the quality control. So, it quality control means you are going to run the DNA onto uh, agarose gel and it should give you the three bands for the three forms of the plasmids and ultimately you are going to store the plasmid into at minus 20 or minus 80 degrees Celsius in order to maintain their functionality as well as the structural integrities. Now, it is very important to know that this is a generalized protocol what we have discussed the specific protocol or the techniques for the bacterial uh, bacillus subtilis plasmid isolation may different depending upon the factors such as the strain of the bacteria, the type of plasmids and the interneed uh, downstream applications. Always refer to the established protocol and adopt them based on the specified requirement onto the experimental setup. Now, till then what we have done, done we have discussed about the two host species one which is the E. coli the other is the bacillus subtilis. Although they look very similar to each other they look that they are uh, you know they can be utilized uh, uh, for the uh, different types of applications. But when you are trying to uh, you know perform uh, experiment right when you are trying to or produce a particular protein you are going to have the multiple host strains and within first you are going to choose whether you want to go with the prokaryotic strain or the eukaryotic strain. Once you selected that okay within I will I will uh, like to go with the prokaryotic strain uh, we you are supposed to use which prokaryotic strain you are going to use whether you are going to use the E. coli or whether you are going to use the bacillus subtilis. So, let us see what are the differences between the E. coli and the bacillus subtilis so that it is actually going to make you clear under what circumstances you are going to use the E. coli and under what circumstances you are going to use the bacillus subtilis. So, uh, what is the difference between the bacillus subtilis and E. coli? So, bacillus subtilis and E. coli are of two widely used bacterial host in the biotechnology and molecular biology. Each of the bacteria has its own set of advantages and disadvantages. For, for several reasons that has been listed below, bacillus subtilis is considered as a superior host. Secretion system. The robust secretion system of bacillus subtilis enabled the efficient secretion of the heterologous protein into the extracellular media which allows the easier downstream processing and purification of the protein compared to the protein purification method in the intracellular proteins of the E. coli. This is very important that the bacteria will secrete the proteins into the extracellular media and then what you are going to do is you just collect the extracellular media and it is actually going to not only going to give you the protein without lysis of the bacteria, it is also going to give you the protein which is uh, partially been purified right because uh, not many proteins will be present into the extracellular media. 
Then talking about a protein folding, the basal subtilis has a lower propensity for forming inclusion bodies than the E. coli, which often leads to the higher yield of correctly folded and functional protein. This advantage for the production of biophysical industry and the industrial enzymes. Then talking about the post translational modification, there is no post translational modification into the E. coli, but the bacillus subtilis can perform the post translational modifications such as proteolytic processing, disulfide bond formation and the glycosylation. These modifications are essential for the structural and functional aspect of a protein. For this reason, the bacillus subtilis gives an edge over E. coli as a host where the latter lacks these machine mechanisms. Then the genetic uh, stabilities, the bacillus subtilis generally exhibit higher genetic stability compared to the E. coli particularly for a recombinant DNA construct. This stability is desirable for long term cultivation and industrial scale production process. Then we have the endotoxin levels, so bacillus subtilis produce a significantly lower level of endotoxin than the E. coli. This is advantageous for applications requiring the high purity such as pharmaceutical productions as endotoxin can trigger the immune responses and causes the toxicity in humans. Then we also have the other considerations such as the grass status. So, bacillus subtilis is generally recognized as safe which is called as grass by the regulatory agencies such as FDA. Uh, if you do not know about the FDA, FDA is called as Food and Drug Administration. So, it is called as Food and Drug Administration. It is actually a agency of USA or United States of America, which actually allows the usage as well as the, um, uh, the selling of, uh, it actually allows the usage and the selling of the food grade and pharmaceutical products into the US. This status simplifies the regulatory approval processes compared to the E. coli. Then environmental considerations, so bacillus subtilis is naturally found in soil and it is considered environmental friendly. It uses as a host organism reduces the risk of environmental contamination associated with E. coli commonly found in human and animals gastrointestinal tracts. Then sporulations, bacillus subtilis can form the endospores allowing it to survive harsh conditions such as heat, desiccation and chemical exposure. This robustness is advantageous for the industrial fermentation process and long term storage of the recombinant strains. And uh, despite these advantages, it is important to note that the choice of host organism ultimately depend on the application's specific requirements such as protein characteristics, scalability, scalability, regulatory acceleration and the availability of the genetic tools and resources. Both bacillus subtilis and E. coli remain valuable host in biotechnology and molecular biology research with its niche and application. So, it is not like E. coli is not very useful, it is actually useful for many applications and it is also desirable in uh, many types of applications compared to the bacillus subtilis. But uh, as far as the industrial uh, applications and as well as the industrial production of any factor is concerned, the bacillus subtilis is having the edge over the E. coli. So, if you are going to use the uh, strain for the uh, normal laboratory research, I think the E. coli would be the choice, but if you want to use it for the industrial application, then it has to be bacillus subtilis. So, this is just a summary of what we have discussed just now. So, it is a with that comparative of the bacillus subtilis and the E. coli. So, bacillus subtilis has the robust security system, the E. coli does not have any kind of security system and that is makes the bacillus subtilis as advantageous because you can be able to collect the protein of your interest directly from the secretion product and it will actually allow the purification of that protein also better. Then it actually have the better folding system compared to the E. coli. right? Then it can produce the post translational modifications such as the uh, disulfide formations and glycosylation and proteolytic processing which is not possible in the case of E. coli. Then you also have the higher recombinant genetic stability this means it is actually going to keep the recombinant DNA intact for a very very long time whereas that is not possible in the E. coli system. Then it also has the uh, usually found in soil and that is considered environmental friendly as discarding it does not hamper the niche right because it is present in the soil. So, when you throw 
this bacteria into the soil, it is out going to contaminate the soil. Compared to that, uh, the E. coli is uh, also present in the human gastro uh, intestinal tract. And so, when you are going to throw the bacteria into the environment, it is going to contaminate the water and ultimately it may actually cause the pathogenic strains, it, it may cause the disease actually. Uh, is uh, Bacillus subtilis is capable of producing the endospores and that is why it is ha having the uh, high resistance to withstand the adverse conditions. Uh, and that is why it is uh, good for the industrial type setting, whereas the E. coli is incapable of producing such endospores and have to be maintained at a condition favorable for its growth. So, ultimately uh, we have discussed, uh, so what we have discussed, we have discussed about the prokaryotic uh, strains or prokaryotic host strains, we have discussed about the bacillus subtilis and E. coli and we have also discussed about their contrasting features. So, with this uh, I would like to conclude my lecture and before we, conclu before we conclude, let me summarize what we have discussed. We have discussed about the definition of the host cells, we discussed that uh, if you want to do the recombinant DNA technology, you require the two factors, you require a host cell, you require a transforming agents right and host cell and transforming agents are always coming in pairs right. If the host cell is from the bacterial origin, the transforming agent also should be from the bacterial origin. So, within the host cells you are going to have the different choices for example, you can have the prokaryotic host cells or you can actually have the eukaryotic host cells. Within the eukaryotic also you are going to have the unicellular yeast, you can have the multicellular animals or you can have the multicellular plants. Now, plant has a cell wall, plant has other kinds of features compared to the animal cell and yeast is a unicellular eukaryotic system. Within the prokaryotic system, we discuss about the E. coli and we also discuss about the bacillus subtilis right. And uh, both of the bacteria are very very useful for the genetic manipulations and as well as the production of recombinant DNA into the large quantities. And we have also discussed about the contrasting features of the vessel E. coli and the bacillus subtilis. So, with this uh, elaborated discussion about the host cells, uh, especially the prokaryotic host cells, I would like to conclude my lecture here. In our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss uh, more about the host cells and then we will also going to discuss about the transforming agents. Thank you.